So our speaker this evening is Professor Tom McLeish, who is a physicist working in the field of polymer physics. Tom has a distinguished career. He was Pro Vice Chancellor of the University of Durham from 2008 to 2014, and he was elected a Fellow of the Royal Society in 2011. He's currently Professor of Natural Philosophy uh, in the University of York. And in the field of science and religion, he's well known for his books, Faith and Wisdom in Science, Let There Be Science, and a new book from last year, The Poetry of Music and Science. And Tommy's going to speak to us this evening on the topic of a theology of science. And I'm going to hand over to you now, Tom. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hugh. It's lovely to be at least virtually here, if not virtuously, with the uh, Faraday Institute uh, once again. Um, speaking actually from my little uh, room in uh, York, as it happens. Um, so I'm going to share some slides because I have some slides for you. And no doubt someone will scream if you can't see that properly. As you can see, the, uh, the title has grown a little bit. We've grown a subtitle uh, because I wanted to tell a better story. Um, um, I hope we are going to tell a better story. And yes, the, the front covers of those two books you kindly mentioned for further reading. <clears throat> Before we get to question time, I'd like to outline um, what I think a better story or envelope of stories um, that uh, we can tell about science or religion. And as we go, I, um, I might be using the word narrative. This is because when you're a pro vice chancellor for research in a university, to hold your head up in the uh, humanities faculties, you must never tell the word story when you can use the word narrative. But there we are. Um, and here we go. Uh, so what I'd like to say is that, is that science actually itself Science needs a better story. It's not just science and faith that need a better story, but that within particularly Judeo-Christian tradition, there is ready-made a very old and deeply human story uh, that can help us tell a better story today about science. Again, never mind at first, science and and faith. What we need to do is to rethink this story in the light of the story told in the Hebrew Bible, picked up and transformed in the New Testament, particularly in the light of what's known as the wisdom corpus. Um, those of you who know a little bit about what I've read and spoken about before will not be surprised that we will be visiting the book of Job again today, which I think is the, uh, the core resource uh, for, this, for this story. There's also a way in which reading Job in Genesis, for example, and the multiple creation stories in the Old Testament in the light of each other is a good thing to do. Um, and that part of this story is to do with what we cannot know with what is chaotic, what is random, uh, what um, is, is surprising, unpredictable, and in some sense, mildly offensive about the world. Um, I'm going through this quickly so you know where we're going, all right? And uh, what I'd like to do is to label this story um, a theology of science. Forgive me to repeat this, but so, uh, so frequently we find ourselves guided into this mindset that we need to tell an oppositional story of faith and science. Um, uh, uh, unfounded belief in unprovable things versus empiricism and so forth. Um, I want to turn that story inside out and tell a different story, which is uh, a story of purpose, a story of being human, and where science fits into that story. Um, and I think that through that, um, we can equip uh, the church to live out a creation calling on behalf <coughs> of, uh, of, of humanity. So here's a slide for people who like words. Um, let's ask a few people who want to know by now uh, what the fundamental biblical story is. Um, let's give Tom Wright a voice. Something is deeply amiss, he writes, in Creation and Covenant. Um, and within that, within humankind itself, something to which the covenant of Israel is the answer, something is deeply amiss with a covenant, whether Israel sins on the one hand or, or Genesis oppression on, on the other, uh, or perhaps both. And the answer is a reinvoking of creation, or rather God as creator. Um, John Walton has written uh, in a, re a recent uh, collected volume, uh, Knowing Creation, a seven day account, is designed to show God ordering the cosmos to be a sacred space functioning for people. Humankind's mission statement in Genesis 1 is to order the cosmos to be functional for people who are then given the role of co-order bringers. Um, 
final quote here from Jürgen Moltmann from Tübingen, um, current, current uh, a theologian from its foundation by its very nature the church is cosmos oriented as Maltman it was a modern and dangerous contraction when the church came to be narrowed into the human world well there's a wordy slide um, for those who perhaps prefer pictures I think here's a picture that says the same thing the bible story has not words it has a sort of not just words it has a geometry it has the geometry of relationship between the creation, which divides into the human part and the non-human part of the creation. Humans have a very special created relationship, both to creator God and to creation itself. Ha. So you can see where I'm going with this. If that is true, and if part of our outworking of this narrative within creation is to help in a co-creaturely way to creation to flourish, then Science, if science is anything that allows us to negotiate wisely and in knowledge how we can understand and make creation flourish, has to be right at the centre of this story. So why we have somehow got ourselves into the position where we're forever having to reconcile the idea with, of, of science with a biblical faith, for example, beats me. This is where I think it belongs. No, you don't need to believe, believe me yet. You can see where we're going afterwards. So I'm going to uh, spend the next few minutes talk, picking up some clues from, um, from different stories. Perhaps that, that's a mountain to climb. Let's look around the foot of the foothills of the mountain um, and uh, look at how people and publics talk about science. Here's a project uh, that I love very much. It was actually done in, in, in Durham uh, University just before I arrived there. Um, by um, some sociologists and social geographers on how people talked about nanotechnology. Now, this sort of exercise of what are the narratives, what are the people, what are the stories people are saying around science in public has been, uh, that sort of research program has now been run many times. In fact, it's running right now around COVID-19. You can run it around genetically modified foods. You can look at uh, nuclear power, nuclear waste. But what one finds is that in focus groups or in media, or in social media, or broad sheets, or, or, or um, public policy panels, is that there are a number of different stories, perhaps five have emerged, uh, with which people who aren't scientists in the main frame science. Um, one is the be careful what you wish for story. Another is the opening Pandora's box that science un locks a chest full of trouble for us, um, which of course one can never get back in the box. Uh, one is a sacred story about nature being a sacred space over which we ought not to trespass, and that messing with nature is what science and its daughter products of technology do. That science creates an elite, or a political or, or intellectual elite, from which or from whose body of knowledge others are excluded and kept in the dark. That science has an economic role to play in an oppressive structure in which the rich get poor, richer and the poor get poorer. And the philosopher Jean-Paul Dupree has written about um, a generalization of these narratives, which he claims arise, arise again and again in different contexts. To be careful of what you wish for, Buzz, Buzz was, was, the, was the ancient and rather despairing, destructive narrative of desire. Um, the idea that science unlocks Pandora's box is a sort of just so story of evil, that messing with nature is an ancient, atavistic, um, uh, theme of, of, of not trespassing on the sacred that goes back a very long way even to prehistory, that being kept in the dark um, is the conflict narrative of alienation and the last one of exploitation. Now I said you could look somewhere else, so why don't we look in the newspapers and, and media headlines of today uh, as a little exercise. So I've carried this exercise uh, out um, with the help of, uh, of uh, Francesca Colt and uh, Amanda Reese, my colleagues in sociology uh, across the way from physics in, in York, who've done this um, uh, to the debate going around the co coronavirus. Um, can we pick up in the narratives around the science that we are or are not following, of course, around co coronavirus? Well, desire. When we have a vaccine, we desire science to deliver um, the ideals that we um, 
uh, that we seek. Now, Justin Welby, and that's what ABC stands for, Archbishop of Canterbury, um, called it, I'm not going to comment on whether he was well advised or not, but caused this, called the virus an unmitigated evil. Um, Jane Goodall, the uh, wonderful uh, uh, naturalist, uh, um, uh, they who discovered that uh, chimpanzees use tools, um, has hinted at least that behind some of her remarks that we brought this pandemic on ourselves, that we trespass on the animal kingdom and bring this on ourselves. Alienation wasn't difficult to, to find out. There's accusations of this flying all around the place. GPs, uh, um, for example, just one example, we've had zero information. We're out of the picture here. Um, and in terms of exploitation or exploited or um, rich and impoverished communities, just look at the strange, the bizarre inequalities of risk around um, the uh, effects of the virus. So these multiple crisscrossing, rather despairing narratives inflict the way science is talked about in our societies and has done for years. And this is what I mean by science itself needing a new story. Uh, let's look at um, uh, some late modern philosophy, or this is for philosophy of literature from George Steiner, but we might have, Heidegger, we might have looked at Hannah Arendt, we looked at a number of, 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 of 20th century uh, figures who've articulated, well, Hannah Arendt called it the human condition, um, didn't she? The, what it is about to be human, in what ways do we suffer? In what ways can we articulate our discomfort in this world? And I love this uh, um, summary statement from George Steiner uh, in the context of art. He's, only art goes some way, he writes, towards waking and uh, towards making accessible towards waking into some measure of communicability, the sheer inhuman otherness of matter. He's talking about a world in which the human recoils, or is tempted to recoil from the strangeness of just how unhuman the world in which we live is. And it's interesting that he invokes another human product, another human process, a creative process of art to bridging, if you like, that, uh, that gap. It's from a wonderful book called Real Presences. Um, here's some science that I'm thinking about uh, have been for a, a while actually of um, I do soft I'm a soft matter uh, uh, physicist for a good uh, number of days of, of the week and at the moment for recent years I've been working with biologists molecular biologists um, interested in how the the physics of um, of the, the molecular seething random hot molecular world uh, can help inform, uh, help us to understand how biology works. Here's a, um, here, well, here's a picture of a protein molecule binding to DNA in, in, in one of these beautiful structures that biologists um, like to draw. But here's a computer simulation at room temperature of that same system with not quite a, well, with, with, with uh, atomic resolution down to where most of the heavy atoms are. And you can see that this thing is in constant seething motion. I could talk for a long time about this and we don't have, have time to. But if I reflected on my scientific career the last 30 years, I would say that the question that's most fascinated me is this issue of how order and structure at multiple scales emerges from a molecular substrate whose world looks like this, who is seething with disorder, with entropy, with a random motion we call heat. It's a puzzling thing. this extraordinary capacity of the mind to grasp and model the material and to understand unseen worlds is not a story a narrative restricted to the early modern world and beyond here's another wordy slide for the people who like the words last one for the for the picture people again here's gregory of nyssa one of the great uh, church fathers in his extraordinary um, patristic book on the soul and the, re and the resurrection. And I'll read this little, little account from the fourth century. It fascinates me. He's arguing, there he is on the bottom right in iconic form, uh, arguing, arguing with his dying sister Macrina, there's she next to him. Uh, that's the uh, Zitzin Leben of this, of this book. And they talk in the end about whether the mind is real um, or just an epiphenomenon of matter. And this is Gregory. Um, uh, 
uh, giving his coup de grace of his argument that the mind is real, it is by an abuse of language, he says, that the jar is said to be empty. For when it is empty of any liquid, it is nonetheless, even in this state, full in the eyes of the experienced. And he goes on to talk about the experiment of, of a, lowering a jar of water by its of air, an empty jar by its neck into water and realizing that by the phenomena we see, it can't have been empty because rather than the water rushing in, the water into the interior streaming in, the imprisoned air read, on the other hand, being straightened for room by the gush of water along the neck in the contrary direction moves and thus gurgles and bubbles against it. He sees this fight of the water he can see and the air that he cannot, and therefore understands that this air is present, even though to our senses it seems not to be. He's modelling in his mind, you see, a world that goes beyond his bare perceptions. That is why he can argue with his sister, who's just for the sake of rhetorical argument taken up the position that mind doesn't exist, um, but it does. And fascinatingly, for a fourth century theologian whose mind grappled with theological concepts like the Trinity, what is undeniably a scientific move in modern language becomes his argument for the reality of mind itself. Uh, moving through uh, history, we would come to early modern science itself. Um, and for those of you who don't know Peter Harrison's works, I do commend them to you. This is uh, a, 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 a very important book of his, The Fall of Man and the Foundations of Science. It is not repeated often enough um, that the invention of experimental science the final polishing of the invention. It took centuries to emerge, it's very, very clear, and there were met medieval ventures into it, one of which we'll see in just a few slides time. But the final construction of the experimental method, in spite of its logical incongruity, how could you, should one be expected to learn something about a complex a multi-component, interactive, chaotic world by doing something as artificial and as oversimplified as an experiment. That was the argument of the medievals who, who suspected the experimental method. And it's kind of got a point. And it's still alive today, by the way, um, in the biological community between the in vivo people and the in vitro people, but I can say more about that at question time if you like. It required Francis Bacon and others like Robert Boyle, Halleck, Evan Halleck, to bring a theological motivation to the intellectual world uh, to underpin the, uh, the foundations of experimental science. So it is far from the case that, uh, uh, that a, a, a conflict, a perpetual conflict is appropriate to be projected back into, into history. So what I want to say is that idea that science is theologically at the heart of the creator world human triangle has been exemplified and instantiated in practice on a number of occasions and regularly so and pivotal occasions, occasions in the history of science. Science that we've only called science itself historically relatively recently, and I'm very pleased and very grateful to the University of York, as Hugh uh, Rollinson pointed out earlier, um, to have uh, 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 um, called my chair, although I'm in the physics department, natural philosophy, because that's the old name for science and for physics, which I love so much. Natural philosophy, uh, of course, encodes in its etymology a love of wisdom, philosophia, where science encodes the claim to knowledge. And the fact that science itself, in its old words, enshrines wisdom, points us back to the biblical sources for narrative, for our new, our new story. And that's what I wanted to turn to next for just a little while. Um, wouldn't it be lovely to do a whole biblical sweep? Maybe that's another course one year for the Friday and do a whole summer uh, of a biblical sweep through um, wisdom literature around uh, the world, around, around creation. But why not visit just the pinnacle, the peak? And um, what Robert Alter, author of um, uh, uh, biblical poetry, book on, on, on biblical poetry and one on narrative, uh, would claim to be the highest form of poetry in the Old Testament he or Hebrew Bible. It's the Lord's answer to Job, Job's complaints um, in chapters 38 to 40. It's a 
probably one of the most glorious nature poems in the ancient world. And one fascinating aspect of its form is that every stanza of this poem is in the form of a question in which Yahweh poses, the Lord poses to Job, a question and questions about the world. Have you journeyed to the springs of the sea and what did you see there? What is the way to the abode of light? From whose womb comes the ice? Where does ice come from? Can you explain? Here's binding the Pleiades and loosing, loosing Orion stars. For the astronomers among you, you'll know the Pleiades are a tight little star cluster in the wind, autumn winter sky, where it's just next door. The stars of Orion is just a bit brighter, but much further spread. Why are some stars together? One, uh, 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 why are some uh, far, far apart? Do you know these laws of the heavens? Can you apply them to the earth? Extraordinary thing about these questions that rove over the whole domains of, of meteorology and geology and botany and zoology now that we as we now call um, is that they are real questions about real phenomena particularly of of a wild aleatory random nature storms lightnings crop up so we have to dig into this book where does all this come from uh, and the structure of the book of job is itself almost as the poetic form. There are cycles of speeches between this righteous but suffering man, Job, and his friends who start off being good friends, sitting around them in, him in silence, but then they make this terrible mistake and open their mouths and try to explain why he's suffering and what bad things he must have done. But the, this is not just a, the, a book about theodicy or a book about you know, the theology of why suffering exists. It's a, it, it runs into the core of what it means to be a human being in the world. Possibly why William uh, Blake was inspired here. I've got his pictures, some of his pictures, his cycle on Job illustrating this talk. And David Klein, perhaps the leading um, scholar uh, of this book, who spent a large fraction of his intellectual life at the Department of Old Testament Studies in Sheffield studying this book, um, calls it the most intense book, um, theologically, intellectually, of the Old Testament, and why a philosopher like Susan Nyman at the Einstein Institute in Berlin has written to the effect that Western philosophy itself stands on not one pillar of Plato, but two pillars, but pillars namely Plato and the Book of Job. So that's enough motivation to, 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 to carry on and having a little bit of a, a, a deeper look at, at Job. And I want to take one little slice of this book, which is to pick out its references to nature for one of the criticisms that have been levelled at the Lord's answer, which is supposed to be an answer to the question, why me from Job? Why am I suffering? Why is this amoral thing happening to a moral world one of the criticisms leveled against the lord's answer is that it does not answer it's a load of questions and there are questions which job knows the answer doesn't know the answer it sounds like a put down thirdly they're about nature lightning stars hail why these cycles of speeches tend to visit different realms of nature so nature acts not just its and many foregrounded examples throughout the book but shapes the crescendo and the poetic form of the book. The first cycle of speeches um, draws its illustrations of nature predominantly from the earth, from the winds, inanimate mass, stones and sea. The second cycle moves into the living world of plants, animals, vines. And the third cycle, where they, if you like, the gloves come off and Job for the first time is accused of being a miscreant and a sinner, is where a whole Hebrew cosmology of the heavens is, is, is opened up. So it's by no means true to say that the Lord's answer is, is uh, detached in terms of subject matter from the rest of this book. This is one reason why a physicist like me finds the whole book so, so it, it, exciting. Um, we could dive into some close level of detail here, but you can just see from this particular example from chapter six I've brought out, this is the sort of thing, um, way in which nature in its chaotic, wild, unpredictable side is called upon to illustrate and expand Job's moral complaint. His brothers are treacherous as the wad is. They're dry and then they uh, overflow. You can't, uh, you can't grow crops in, uh, in them. His own body is um, almost dissolving away with disgusting sores and 
and things. This is a, um, a, a, a real poetic expression of the felt participation that a human being has, particularly when you're ill uh, in, in, in being physically instantiated. Um, but Job has this double complaint, you see. He's complaining about this lack of law in nature as a parallel or concomitant law or absence of law to the moral law he's suffering from. Um, God, he accuses of holding back the waters and letting them loose, just like um, his brothers who've been like the Wadis. Throughout the book, there's this paradoxical clash of little hopeful sunbeams that come through. Uh, here's Eliphaz, one of Job's friends, and sometimes wisdom is actually to be found in the words of the, of the friends. He says, Job, there will be a day, it will come, if you ask for reconciliation, forgiveness, where you will be at peace once more. And he says it's an extraordinary thing. He uses the Hebrew word there for covenant, for the covenant relation, for the Abrahamic um, Mosaic covenant. But with the stones of the field, it's extraordinary and shocking uh, expression of a very high level of relationship between the human and the most humble of inhuman objects. And yet those same stones participate in the chaotic entropy driven we might say today erosion of structure um, uh, the mountain slowly slips away there's one of the rare uh, examples in ancient literature of the slow processes of geological time and so the analogy is it becomes a metaphor for the slow erosion of humans hope I mentioned in the third cycle one more little taste of the cycle is that this is where the gloves come off um, uh, and we are uh, ushered into um, the, 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 the realm of, of, of heavenly Hebrew cosmology. But it's, it's a distorted, twisted, horrifically twisted cosmology. Um, read Eliphaz's words in chapter 22 here. Thick clouds veil the Lord in the height of heavens, so he cannot see as he goes his way on the vault of heavens. Every other representative of God covered in a cloud in the Hebrew scriptures has our sight being shielded from God by the cloud, not God's sight, seeing out onto creation. But there is the creation stretching out the heavens, suspending the earth in the middle of the waters and drawing a circle on the face of the, of the waters and the boundary between light and dark. It's um, a strong resonances from Genesis and Job all the way through. And then at a point at which the um, arguments tighten and become dis uh, destructive to, to, to the point of silence, uh, comes before the Lord's answer another hymn, another voice, a new heart. It's called the uh, hymn, uh, a wis hymn to wisdom sometimes. It's chapter 28, another lovely poem. And in the Northeast, when I was working in Durham, um, discovered to my delight that in the mining villages around Durham. It's called the Miner's Prayer. And every miner's child uh, knows uh, Job 28 because it's the place where miners are mentioned and what they do when their work is mentioned. There's a mine for silver and a place where gold is refined and the miners swing beneath the surface of the earth. And you wonder well, well, why at this point of this angry argument about the awful uh, diseased, chaotic world in which we have to survive or try to survive as humans, are we talking about mining? And then the metaphor becomes clear because the foreign way, the miners, forgotten by travellers, underneath the earth, they have a lamp. They, they, their eyes get to see the structure of the earth that other human beings' eyes cannot see in almost a priestly way. They are in this special place, seeing the rocks that are the source of lapis, the jewels, seeing the seams of precious stones. This poem becomes a search for wisdom, whose answer is that God knows the wisdom and paradoxically, to many translators who've had trouble with this over the years, uh, Basil the Great in his commentary on Job couldn't, couldn't do this. Um, he couldn't uh, admit that if it was God looking into the substructure of nature, as we have here at the end of the book, beholding everything under the heavens, assigning uh, weight to the wind and determining more waters by measure, that it wasn't God in the first verse. But it isn't God in the first verse. It's minus. So this is a way in which perhaps this is the 
the chapter that I would offer um, as the literary equivalent of the triangle I drew at the beginning of this, of, of this talk, the special place that humans hold in our perceptive ability to see into the structure of creation under God. And throughout the book of Job, we find that there, between Job and his friends, and Yahweh himself, are these different ways of thinking and articulating the relationship of humans and nature, that nature is actually a moral institute, instituted uh, law that slaps you on the back of the hand when you've been bad and gives you fruit from apple trees when, you, when you've been good, that it's an eternal mystery that we'll never understand. That's um, Elihu at one point in the book. Um, uh, uh, Zophar uh, asks, wrote Job to read nature like a book, and that's a metaphor which has run and run through, through the history of science, isn't it? Job has the view that, as we've seen, that nature is an uncontrolled chaos and that God should know better. Um, he's once accused of making it an object of worship, which he forcibly denies. Have we seen these narratives somewhere before? I said they were ubiquitous in our current world. I claim is that these are some of the narratives that persist across cultures and through time in one form or another, simply because the human condition of surviving in a world that is not human is, uh, is a shared fixed point of, of all humanity that ever has owned the name. But Job provides, as we've already seen, another narrative, another story, which is the way to wisdom. It's the way to wisdom in Job 28, in the poem, but it's also the way to wisdom that those questions in the Lord's answer beckon Job into. And I suggest it might be uh, the narrative that we can translate through time into our own age and rethink as our calling of the church. <laughs> Other people have, uh, have rethought this before. I should. Uh, I um, wanted to just give you this one example of a uh, of a scientist I know who was inspired by this book because he tells us he was. I was um, actually once challenged by one of the atheist blogs out there um, to provide one example of how the Book of Job has stimulated science. Now I provided an example, but my answer wasn't posted on the blog. But there you go. Um, but Theodoric of Freiburg. Um, who simultaneously with a Baghdad uh, medieval uh, scientist called Kamal al-Din, both in the early 14th century, did, as Newton was to do three centuries later in a different context with prisms, with model spheres filled with water, uh, modelling the act of raindrops. And they were the people that, who, who really first nailed the geometric optics of the, of, of the, ra of the, uh, the rainbow. Um, Theodoric was a Benedictine, um, and in his, his book De Luce is Origine, the uh, uh, light and its, its origin. He writes about his motivation for making light in its many manifestations, his scientific study. Um, by what way is the light scattered and heat distributed upon the earth is his translation of one of those verses in, in the Lord's answer to Job. This is a difficult question, the Lord proposed to holy Job, he says, and I thought I'd have a go at answering it. There's uh, from his um, one of the copies of his manuscript, we have his diagram of the reflection and refra double refraction of light inside raindrops splitting up into colors, 1308. Who knew that? And that's the glorious sight we see. The rainbow, by the way, has been for me is a wonderful story, a science story through the ages. But then again, another an another talk. So look what happens when we take this just to finish with into the New Testament. Um, and when one's attuned to this triangle of creation, a steward of creation and creator, and sharing in a relational, a developing relation between the human and the non-human, which is what Book of Job is all about, you find his resonances everywhere in the apostles. You find his resonance in Paul. Uh, God gave us the ministry of reconciliation, 2 Corinthians uh, 5, verse 17, not just verse 17, Corinthians 5, verse 17, that God was reconciling the world, the Greek is cosmos, to himself in Christ. And um, in the same fortnight that we that uh, James uh, Dunn has, has, has died, former um, wonderful Romans scholar, uh, has just recently died, but he wrote in his... Uh, match this commentary to, to Romans about the out of source sortedness, the disjointedness within the created order, 
that human beings feel that makes it a suitable habitation for those also who have a broken relationship with their creator. All creation groans, writes Paul, um, until the sons and daughters of God are, are revealed in their glory. So what does that mean about our task? And I've had a go at summarising what a a theolog theology of science, what a new story might be. Um, I wanted to try and get the word count down so you could tweet it. So uh, here we are, drawing on all that um, resource. What's it mean to draw science at the beginning, in the middle of that triangle? I think it means this, that science is, it's a work, maybe more to say it's a toolbox that equips us for the work, the participative work, participating with each other and under God, this relational work and the co-creative work in which we engage with, with the natural world. That's what we do in agriculture, that's what we do in medicine, that's what we do in architecture, that's what we do in almost everything we do. With healing this broken relationship that humans have with nature, it recognises that our relationships are broken. One of the great fresh things, one of the things that I remember as a young man attracting me to Christianity was its realistic grasp uh, of the fact that things are wrong with our relationships, not only with each other with, and with God, but with uh, the creation that we find ourselves in. So here's this new narrative and what might it mean for us, perhaps we can talk about this in question time, but some of the things it might mean, you see, is that it recognises that the thing we now call science has a much longer history of relationship between the human and the non-human whose propulsive energies start right back in the ancient world. Um, we know it started, that was true of the Hellenistic world, but I've tried to make the case tonight that's also true of, of the um, Hebraic and Semitic world. But this gives us a very high view of our aptitude to reimagine nature, so high that Gregory of Nyssa drew an example from this aptitude to illustrate our God-given minds and God-like minds themselves. That it has this dual structure. This is one of the reasons I like not calling science science, but calling it natural philosophy, because knowledge without wisdom can be so destructive, impoverished, superficial, dangerous, actually. Um, it seems to me that the message of knowledge with wisdom is the one we need to carry on forward, even through a nature which is going to be ambiguous and painful, whether we like that or not. Read Genesis 3, if you're surprised by that. And that we will expect, as Yahweh encouraged Job to expect, that a creation fruitful enough to throw up planets and plants and people has to enjoy and embrace this balance between order and what we might call chaos, or possibly even creative chaos. And that sometimes our questions are getting answered and sometimes they don't. One of the things that I love about the science poem of Job 38 to 40 is that it celebrates the creative question. It always seems to me that what makes the difference between uh, really mold-breaking transformative science and okay science is not the quality of the answers, it's the quality of the questions in the, in the lab. And that this is wrapped up in love. Not a word one often juxtaposes with science. But in this story, one that very much belongs there. So it's time to conclude and uh, to tackle some, uh, some questions. Um, more fine covers, apologies for that, but um, York Minster, which is uh, much more beautiful. Um, what I want to say is that removing this false opposition of science and faith, um, but gleaning theological resources from both of them for each other is both promising and practical. And that's where this story starts, not with, with conflict. But that in order not be able to say very much about how we could circle around, perhaps through the church and connect this much fresher narrative of wisdom to some of these more dismal narratives that still infect our public sphere of science, that we could, we could actually do this and bringing out some of these uh, more positive submerged narratives um, around uh, co-creaturely building relationships with, with, with nature um, is a way in which we could actually share science more than we do um, and, 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 and certainly navigate uncertainties like our, our present time in a far healthier 
way. Uh, that wisdom um, is uh, an idea and the fact a life we have to work with more in our theology as in our, our science as a purpose, a teleology for engaging with, with nature. And then actually all this might even find other doors for people to come and enjoy science more. And one of the problems I have is, is that this dismal narrative, Jean Poet de Puy's fourth, um, of, uh, of uh, elitism or being shut out into the dark, um, seeing scientists, I think Angela, Angela Tilby put it once, as the priests of our modern age who seem to have the keys to, um, uh, to the knowledge of our world. That's not right. That should be should be shared and 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 could be. So with that, I'll thank you very much for bearing with me so far, and I hand back to Hugh, and we'll tackle some questions, shall we? Thank you. Thank you, Tom, very much for a very illuminating discussion. A number of questions have come in while you've been speaking. And I'll attempt now to synthesize one or two of these and um, let's lead into some discussion. Tom, do you think uh, from your early part of your talk where you talked about the chaotic nature of the natural world that you see in your own physics, do you think that requires us then to rethink the nature of God as we, as we see this level of disorder in our world? Um, well, it depends what idea of God we start with. Um, uh, the way I read, <laughs> but so the way I, um, well, no, I think the answer is no. Um, for one thing, what we call chaos, or to form, to, to, to use the technical term, perhaps entropy, um, is about us rather than the world. It's about our ignorance. It's about all the variables we can't see, that we want to lump into a big variable that we can and we want to somehow control it. Um, uh, God, the scriptures tell us, knows every sparrow that falls, every hair on the head. Um, we might even have read or translated that as knowing every atom's collision. I, I don't know. So our ignorance is something which we need to be intellectually humble about. Um, but also, I, to, there is an extent to which what looks like chaos to us is a creative chaos. So behind God's questioning of Job, I think it, it's a message that runs a little bit like this. OK, Job, you're complaining about the chaos of the lightning or the uh, uh, randomness of the flood and the existence of disease which is infecting your own skin as we speak. You know, I could give you a perfectly ordered world if you wanted to, Job, a, as regular as a crystal, as predictable as this stone, but it would be every bit as lifeless. Thank I you. Was like. Okay, let's, um, let me change direction slightly. Um, you've drawn quite a lot of your talk from a piece of very ancient literature from the Jewish Christian tradition. Um, is it helpful to look into other religious traditions to help us understand this relationship between science and faith and telling a better story? Yes, it is. Um, and uh, there are um, you know, one of the... Um, one of the motifs that is, that is shared, one of the questions shared by faith traditions, that the, the ways of life and the narratives we've come to call religions in the last three or four hundred years or so, uh, not before, by the way, but um, is, is, is the idea of how human beings um, live within the non-human world. I mean, it is one of the one of the central questions. And it's one of the central questions that all of those traditions have tackled. Um, the uh, to take one example, um, Aboriginal cultures have fascinating stories to tell. Um, the creation story, the rainbow snake, um, and and the, the 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 ubiquitous desire to tell creation myths, by the way, is I think one um, way in which there's a, there's a huge richness of question. Could it be this? 
could it be that? Um, uh, uh, and it's, it's interesting that that it seems quite difficult for human traditions to break out of the world of animals and humans just blown up into large pictures that we know. So it's a snake or it's a Norse god um, that's a bit like us, but a bit more cruel and a bit and a bit a bit a bit stronger. Um, so what one has all these all these questions, um, and then. Uh, a completely really radically new story comes along um, that that talks about a single one who is also embedding community trinity within themselves who is in one sw uh, swoop as inhuman and beyond human and transhuman as you could possibly get and at the same time as intimate as you could possibly could possibly experience i mean that really is something extraordinarily fresh about about that story um, but i would say yes there is richness and poetic insight and metaphors and a sort of meta now a story of stories to learn uh, by comparing traditions and faiths thank you that's very helpful um, i'm going to read this next question um as it, as it appears on my screen um my question for tom is could he share a bit on the differences between a theology of nature Mm -hmm. and natural theology and as mm -hmm. a follow-up question so this, this is a two-part question yeah. what does he make of movements such as the intelligent design movement who are modern proponents of natural theology according to the questioner yeah yeah okay i'll be perfectly honest about that um uh, i think the the natural theology pe people got the words in the wrong order <laughs> and still do for that for that reason um uh, that the that it's it's actually very dangerous to read nature as a book um i, I referred to this uh, earlier on uh galileo um uh talked about the the book of nature that we read um uh um hugh of st victor in the 13th century had the same thing i think it goes right boethius talks about the same uh, has the same idea even cicero i think refers to um, nature as a sort of book augustine also does but warns us of its of its shortcomings now trying to read god into nature is not the command that humans receive in the commission in Genesis and in wisdom through New, New, the New Testament, which is to um, which is to look into nature with God's eyes. Let me put it. Let me do one do one of those the sort of geometry things like that triangle. It was Celia Dean Drummond at um, Notre Dame and now Oxford who helped me see this. She, we were having a discussion. And she said, "Tom, I understand why it is you don't like natural theology, which is which is you know, I'm being odd, you know." Um, your foot against a stone, things just a stone, and, and, and a watch. So someone made, must have must have weighed a watch on the eye. God must have made an eye, but so wonderful. Um, no, no, no. What the the Bible's view of 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 the relationship geometry between us, nature, and God, is not natural theologies that we look through nature to see God, mm -hmm. but that we are looking into nature, shoulder to shoulder with God, with His same eyes, and co-creaturally love. So we don't see God in nature, we look into nature and understand it as if it were impiously possible with something like a shadow of his, of his ideas and his, and his mind. That's what Job 28 does. So I'm an anti-natural um, theolo theologist, but I'm very pro-theology um, of science because it's the, it's, it's, the, it's the answer to the question of what then do we do with this gift of science? in the kingdom of God? That's the question. Thank I, you. I hope that's helpful. Okay, look, Great let, me, um, let me ask you again a question from the screen, uh, something a little bit more personal. And the questioner asks, how has your theological view impacted your own approach to scientific research, particularly in your own field? That's absolutely a lovely question. Um, and I'm not sure I asked it very well at all till I've been in the game um, of science that is for quite a long long time and then I I, I realized I, I first of all came I came across the book of Job as an early Christian a long time ago and was absolutely bowled bowled over by it to find this wonderful wonderful questioning um, 
uh, seed of, of, of seed of science or early tributary of the river we now call science perhaps there. Um, but I never articulated why it was that I, you know, I've spent 30 years now um, <laughs> st studying statistical mechanics and soft matter and which is the question of how order arises out of chaos. Now, yeah, I, I, I didn't do this deliberately and think, okay, well, this is my theology, so I better choose physics, which is ob obviously emerges from this. Um, but nonetheless, I think it's far more um, subliminal, but I do think there's a connection between, between the theological journey and venture, venture I've had and the scientific questions I'm fascinated in, which is the tension between order and, and chaos and how cell membranes, um, uh, maintain the, their own integrity and the integrity of transport information flow in the cell and yet could not do so if they were entirely rigid and ordered structures to pull on another uh, example because there are ways in which in which being a Christian should affect the way one works in any domain the way one works with other people um, the whole issue of uh, humility um, to which one always aspires, um, uh, the support of others. Um, uh, but I think that's not quite the question you are asking. I think Maybe the first one is. There's two parts of the question, isn't there? One is formulating scientific questions and the other is mm. doing the practice of science. And I think you've given us a bit of an answer to both. Oh, yes. Well, I tell you what, it, it, what has helped me here um, is that the theology has directly informed my own little personal P with a small P philosophy of science. Um, so uh, so it, I, 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 I've imported from, if you like, the theology into what for me has been a really practical philosophy of science, which is that questions are much more important than answers. And that the scientific method that um, someone like Popper talks about in, he, in his, his work. It's only the tail end of the full process of science, conjectures and refutations and all that, and, 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 and um, uh, refutability and non-verifiability, blah, blah, blah. Um, it's all what we do with our hypotheses when we have them. But to have somehow inculcated in our young people and our students that the scientific method is, is a method of, 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 of just checking hypotheses without uh, without hinting that no one knows where hypotheses come from and that that's the key step um, seems to be to be uh, a, an unfortunate impoverishment of our of our um, formation the formation we give our young scientists and indeed of how we talk about science in, in the wider public which is why I wrote that recent book called the poetry and music of science because I wanted to write about desperately write about how important creativity is in science uh, from schools talks where I was told by pupils they gave up science because they didn't think it was creative or they couldn't use their own imagination and I thought what have we done um, so that for me that's that big part of the way I think about science has come directly from the pages of, of the wisdom literature yeah and yeah. experience Thank you. Um, here's another one that I think is a little bit related to this previous question. The questioner asks, could you expand the relationship between the mystical and alienation, which you allude to? I'm interested because I think mystical draws us to God rather than alienates us. So I think this question is referring again to the whole concept of chaos at a, an atomic level, which you're referring to. It may be, I'm not sure quite what it does refer to, but it's a really interesting question, whatever it refers to. Um, so the, the mystical or contemplative um, is, again, is, a, a, is a, another hmm, human activity um, that has woven itself in some form or other through all cultures as far as we know, uh, but doesn't seem to find, at least in our culture, a place in science. Until you begin to listen hard to scientists' actual stories about where great ideas or revelations come from, Heisenberg's extraordinary, exhausted, mystical experience in Heligoland, where um, into his mind swum operators in quantum mechanics that didn't, didn't commute. I mean, and I, I could uh, relate many, many other experiences like that, some most far less grandiose and significant. Um, again, I'm not quite sure. We'd have to have a discussion with the questioner. Perhaps they can email me if I'm not if I'm not scratching where where the question itches. But um, I, I, I do think 
I agree that the mystical, um, both as a, as a sort of religious or worship, as an experience of contemplative worship and as an experience of science, can deliver ways in which a sort of logical or method, methodological process cannot, and experience both of the world which we imagine, imagine through science and of God, um, with whom we also receive a relationship. Thank you. Um, there's one final question here, which I think again follows on from what you've just said, and that really is applying what you've said in your talk to the lives of people who are in churches. And so the question is that we don't hear very much about the theology of science day to day in our regular congregation. Uh, I sense you agree with that. Love that <laughs> What a lovely like? question. Oh, that we did, because it would be so natural to do so. Um, and uh, I've said many times, wouldn't it be wonderful if we prayed for and celebrated our young people going off to universities just as much as to do chemistry degrees or physics degrees, just as much as we did those going off to be doctors or mission, missionaries or whatever. Wouldn't it be wonderful if um, churches became um, uh, uh, as places that celebrated um, the way the gift of science, as in fact they have done. I was involved in a really interesting um, uh, uh, science festival put together by churches in Leeds a few years ago that did exactly this. And you know, um, some of you may know I'm involved in a, 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 I think it's a wonderful project with David Wilkinson, who's well known to, to some of you and to Faraday, certainly uh, principals at John's College Durham. We have uh, funding for a project called Equipping Christian Leadership in an Age of Science. Um, in terms of its Anglican wing, I just like to call it science bishops. Uh, so they're working with bishops, senior Christian leaders. We thought we'd start there. Um, and we, one of the things we do is to um, generate uh, opportunities for, for senior Christian leadership to discuss cosmology or earth sciences or medicine. And we get them into the labs talking with young scientists, not, not, not church going scientists, but they're both brave um, and, and both think that each other are going to be a bit weird. And within 15 minutes, um, it's yak, 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 yak. There is an extraordinary fellow feeling between, uh, between learned and senior Christian church leaders and scientists of all ages. That's an empirical little social science discovery, but I think it runs very deep. The second thing we do is, that's if you like as a top-down work, is a bottom-up work. It's a project called Scientists in Congregations, um, where we stimulate and help catalyze and resource projects for scientists in ordinary parish churches, in cathedrals, in free churches, churches to run um, events that celebrate, develop worship material for, involve science in mission, just celebrate science. Um, and things are changing, that wherever you look, that change is natural once it happens. The, the worship around and thanksgiving around and Eucharist, if you like, around celebrating science's gift Norwich Cathedral, for example, regularly turns itself into a wonderful science museum um, and is going to host Dippy the Dinosaur, I think, uh, very soon or um, when it, 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 it can, in the nave, and there's going to be worship around it. I realise I know you're looking at me, time's going on, time's going on, but this is something I'm obviously very excited about because if, every, if anything I've said is true, the consequence is that the church has a real calling to supply um, our countries and our societies with this healthy narrative of science as gift and wisdom that will allow those of us who are scientists, those of us who are making difficult, tough decisions about, about the coronavirus, for example, as, as, as politicians, to listen and to be humble and to accept the uncertain and chaotic world in which we live, but to provide us with ways of negotiating and living with nature uh, rather than fighting it and being part of God's story of, of, of uh, uh, new creation, uh, of old creation, forgiveness, fall, um, and new creation that looks towards the, uh, the future. So, yes, very excited about the church. And thank you so much for that, that question. Um, if you want to look it up, the Equipping Christian Leadership and Age of Science, we've got a, a, a website hosted by St. John's College. There's lots of resources there. Talks to this, resources for, for churches. Thanks to you for the chance to um, adver advertise this. But uh, And the Faraday Institute as well, where we are now, as it were, also has tremendous resources uh, for churches that want to experiment doing this. Contact Ruth Bankovitz, I would suggest you do. Thank you, Tom, very much for a fascinating talk. You've, you've, uh, and in the questions particularly, have illuminated a lot of the ideas that you began to uh, develop in the talk.
and just looking at some of the chat and questions that have come online while you've been speaking. Your talk has been greatly appreciated by oh, lovely, many okay. people who've been watching. So that's, that's really great. Thank you.